Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I'm delighted to start this series on Louis Sullivan's Kindergarten Chats. You know, Sherry and I did a couple of meetups on Louis Sullivan, and we've been talking about Louis Sullivan for a long time. Um, and it's delightful to have Sherry, Rupali, Maritza, and Joya uh, on this panel. So what is this book about? Okay, the book, the basic plot is that a student who has just graduated from architecture school goes to Louis Sullivan to learn how to do architecture. Okay. And Louis Sullivan is in the has to kind of make sure that he unlearns everything wrong and then learns how to do architecture. It's not really about architecture, it's about design. It's not really about design, it is about living. That's what the book is. So it's a proper philosophy book, really. Um, this is how Louis Sullivan describes the purpose of the book. The central purpose of this work is to liberate the mind from serfdom to tradition and to exhibit man's natural powers in their creative capabilities when expanding in the open air of the spirit of responsible freedom. In other words, in the true spirit of democracy, from which it follows that the operation of the historic feudal mind and the advance, advancing democratic mind are placed in sharp contrast, okay? So uh, he continues, the appeal therefore is to the broad intelligence of the public mind seeking not only a knowledge and understanding of architecture as a plastic art, but as well a clear view of its societal basis as an art of expression. So this is really about art of expression and it applies to everything that we do. So with that, I'm going, we're going to get started with the panelist. Sherry, you're first, go ahead. Okay, um, so I didn't want to duplicate what Srikant and I have done before. Um, so I, I'm just gonna reference um, and I wanted to kind of give sort of a historic background, kind of, we keep talking about seeds and, that blossom here with Sullivan. It's the theme, it's a phrase he used. So I kind of wanted to talk about the soil um, that Sullivan himself was the seed from. Um, and we already talked in the past, uh, both last week, but then in detail when Srikant and I did this before, about what was happening in Chicago with the Great Fire, um, the decimation of most of the buildings in the city, this massive need to build with new materials that were fireproof. So that's the sort of technical and uh, programmatic needs that were there. But there's also really um, another background that's more of a sense of life background and more of a um, uh, where those ideas come from. The, so we've covered those others. So I wanted to talk more about where Sullivan's ideas come from. Um, what maybe you know from reading or from the previous one, Sullivan's uh, mother was Swiss born. His mom and dad were both immigrants. Um, his mother was Swiss born. His father was Irish. Um, so they were very artistic family. Um, there is uh, this great love of nature. He talks about being in nature, being his school, much more than being in school. Um, and he spends a, interesting little bits of time, not, you know, not a huge chunk of time in any one place. So he, he uh, graduates high school early and gets a couple of years of MIT college out of the way by taking tests. So he advanced, advances into MIT, um, but he's only there for like a year to two years. And then he leaves. Um, for a while, he works with Frank Furness, an architect in Philadelphia. Um, for about a year or so, he ends up leaving there, not on bad terms, but simply because Philadelphia is having an economic crisis and Frank can't keep him on. So he leaves. At one point, he is in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts about a year or so. So we have a man who is um, 
not finding any one place the such a good fit that he stays. So he's bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. Um, this is, I think, a sign of his independence, uh, his individual thinking that is just not fitting in any one of those places. He's bristling uh, with what is being taught in any one of those places. Now, what's interesting is in all of these, and if you read in his autobiography of an idea, one thing that he mentions um, later on is that his time with Frank Furness was more important and influential than in, than his time at IIT, at, at MIT or his time at um, the Ecole de Beaux Arts. So it's really, I think, a good sense for us to take a look at Frank Furness and who he was. Um, and Frank was a, a an architect in Philadelphia who um, has an interesting background. Um, he he was he never went to Europe. This was what a, an American architect would do at that time. You would go to Europe because that's where you would learn buildings. So he didn't. I think he had the financial capability of doing so. He just never did, which is interesting, I think. He had a very unique style of architecture, very frank. It was just his, not frank as in, as in, you know, I mean, I guess it was. In some cases, they were very frank buildings, but they were frank furnace buildings. So there's a very unique character that is specific to this man. Um, and that's a nice little tick box of, you know, Sullivan's influence there. Um, he came from an abolitionist family, very prominent abolitionist family, Frank Furness did. Um, and that is, uh, that is clearly the, the, this is the background is totally willing to look at fresh new ideas. And this is not an, at all an abnormal, there's no sense of following tradition. Um, and the other interesting fact is that Frank Furness was a military man. He um, actually fought in the Civil War um, and received great honor. And uh, for those of you who want to, you can watch Srikant's eyebrows. Um, this is a very interesting little circle of connection here. Frank Furness um, was a captain in a cavalry of Philadelphia. I don't remember the exact um, group he was with. Uh, but he won his Medal of Honor for his heroic actions in the Battle of Trevelyan's Station, <laughs> which happens to be from where I'm projecting from today. Wow. wow. <laughs> so the very <laughs> battlefield is where I live. <laughs> so uh, it's a small world. <laughs> but what I think is interesting about that is that Frank Furness is, this is a man who's I mean, anybody who knows a military man, especially at captain level or above, efficiency and is, is, is important. You have to be efficient about moving your, your groups around, use of materials, all of that thing, that's part of who Frank Furness was. And that really then um, was part of what Louis Sullivan saw in Frank. So, Frank's furnaces buildings were ignored um, and many of them were torn down um, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, but at the 100th anniversary of when Frank Furness formed the American Institute of Architects in Philadelphia, they honored him. They sort of rediscovered him. And a couple of the things that they talked about at that big meeting were these, there's just two or three little lines I wanna to mention to you. One of them, they were honoring him for designing original and bold buildings free of the prevalent Victorian academyism imitation, buildings with such vigor that the flood of classical traditionalism could not overwhelm them or him or his clients. And he was also um, honored for shaping iron and concrete with a sensitive understanding of their particular characteristics that was unique in his time. 
And um, there are several other things that they mention, but then there's this one that I really like. Above all, for creating architecture of imagination, decisive self-reliance, courage, and often great beauty, an architecture which to our eyes and spirits still expresses the unusual personal character, spirit, and courage for which he was award awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for bravery in the Civil War. So here we have a man who is doing very much the kinds of things that we start seeing Sullivan talking about, this individual spirit. Um, the, um, I'm gonna find my line here. Uh, for those of you who've read The Fountainhead, uh, this particular line in chapter three will be quite uh, interesting. Uh, that every building you see is the image of a man who you do not see. That the man is the reality, the building its offspring. That the bricks, stone, steel, and whatnot come into place and response to an impulse. And cause at work behind that impulse was mental, not physical. The impulse came from a man. Now, I could pull up a line from the fountainhead, but I think most of you probably are already know that line. So um, I wanna save a little time to talk about um, how, for, how we're seeing Sullivan use this in his description. So we have in these first five chapters, we have two discussions of buildings, uh, one in chapter three called the terminal station and one in chapter five called the hotel. So I thought it would be fun to share pictures of that, reading that section, because those particular sections, I think, are sometimes the hardest for people to understand. And I want to be able to give you some of the historical background that was going on at that time. So I'm going to share screen. I can share screen, right, Srikant? Yep, here we go. I'm going to share screen. Um, and... Where is, my sharer is here, Rob. Where is your, is it preview? Keynote, keynote. Keynote is Mac for PowerPoint. Okay, and then hit play. All right, can you see this? Yep, okay. So I'm gonna read this first chapter, uh, or the first paragraph of chapter three. Uh, and this is the building that Sullivan is talking about. Um, this is the uh, central station in Chicago. Um, it's really the, the large building in the center and the mass off to the left. These little buildings off to the right are other buildings. Um, what's interesting to note before we get into the discussion, I want you to understand the background. This was built in, I'm thinking 1893, maybe right before that. It was built because the World's Fair was coming to Chicago and that meant a vast quantity of people were coming to Chicago and they needed a proper modern train station to handle all that increased traffic. The World's Fairs were kind of like modern day Olympics. People came from all over the world to see. Um, this was built by not a Chicago architect. It was built by a New York architect. And we'll see in, as we go through Sullivan's work, there is a little head butting that keeps happening. Um, we'll see it as time goes on in, in greater detail of uh, Sullivan is trying to find or reflect um, a fresh new uh, architecture that is specifically American and grows out of American democracy and these same ideas. Um, and what keeps happening is the New York architects with their very historic approach keeps coming back in and it really gets in his craw that they're doing it in his ground on his turf. And then when I show you the building after this, it'll explain that a little bit more. So that's where this building comes in. And 
the other thing I wanted to mention is these essays that that form kindergarten chats, they were published in inland architecture, which is not New York. <laughs> so this was the local architecture magazine. And when he was writing this, it's, they were series. So it was essentially like a column and everybody who was reading it would have walked through this building many, many times. So when he's saying things in this essay, that we don't understand, they would have understood because they've walked through this building all the time. It's like talking about the train station in, in New York for Srikant, you know? It's, it's, so, it's so present in his life that everything, it's just every detail is there. So with that background, here we go. Chapter three, Terminal Station. My son, here is the place perhaps a unique spot on earth, holy in iniquity. And when he's got some of these words in here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause for a second and, and just let those sink in and, and actually put, put that in another phrase. So what he's meaning there is holy in its unholiness. Where to go in, you go out. And to go out, you go in where to go up, you go down, and to go down, you go up. Now, I'm pretty sure that he's talking about the floor plan and the layout, which I don't have, but I'm pretty sure that's what he's talking about here. Then he says, all in all, it seems to me the choicest fruit yet culled from that broad branch of the tree of knowledge, known as the public be damned style. In this instance, the outward aspect of the style takes on the semblance of architecture, much as the speaking tube conducts the voice. Let us regard it curiously. I love the word curiously. Its lucidity of thought is like unto the Stygian murk. Poetic, lucidity of thought. He's looking for clarity of thought. And what he's fine, Stygian was referring to the river Styx, dark murk. <laughs> In other words, he's not finding anything clear whatsoever. Still, I think there's also the phrase, the Stygian muck, is because this is a time when, there, when buildings would actually get dirty. They don't really anymore, but these would get coated black very quickly with all of this coal ash and debris and, po and, and pollution in the air. So buildings would actually get mucky. So he may have been referring to that too. Still, it is characteristically, too char characteristically, an American work. There can alas be no doubt of it. And the study of con contemporaneous architecture, its origins, inspirations, animus, growth, trend, and destiny, constituting a part of our inquiry, the general and personal responsibilities and accountabilities resident behind its distorted and mendacious screens of brick and stone, constituting a correlated part. Now, notice here he's talking about accountability of a residence. He's talking about the accountability of the man, the person whose idea this came from. And he's considering that distorted and mendacious lines of brick and stone. So what he's talking about is what we see on the outside is belying what's on the inside. And he considers that a serious problem, essentially a falsehood. Then he goes on and said, let's just pause before this subject, this subject. And then he calls it this it. And he says, I say it because it is neuter. The masculine implies in mental terms that which is virile, forceful, direct, clear, straightforward, that which retains thought. Well, 
I might quibble with whether or not masculine can <laughs> clear and dress forceful of blood. But you, when you hear what he's saying to this next part, you'll understand where he's coming from. So he's saying it's not that. It's not clear and direct and straightforward. And then he also says, feminine, intuitive sympathy, tact, suavity and grace, the qualities that soothe and elevate, ennoble and refine. Well, he's saying it's not that either. He's calling it, but this it. That's his sense of humor. Then he goes on, this droll and fantastic parody. So again, droll is dry, parody or fantastic. He's referring to bizarre, or grotesque, the irrational. That's the kind of fantastic he's talking about. The droll and fantastic parody upon logic. So what he's saying is this building don't make any sense. And then this finical mass of difficulties. Finical is finicky, finical mass of difficulties. This web of contradictions. It's not going to make sense now, isn't it? This blatant fallacy. This repellent and indurate mass. Now, indurate means hardened. So he's talking about this is a a, not a mass, a mess. So he's talking about a hardened mess, stony mess, essentially. This canker of the tongue and natural spirit, nat of nat natural speech. So all of these things he's talking about are the sorts of discussions you'll hear in the opposite. Like when we read tall office building artistically considered, he explains this from the positive side. So right now he's, he's got his young student, he's trying to unpack and unlearn things. So this was the transport, was the, the main course of transportation for people to come in to the great exhibition that was in Chicago. So the very interesting irony is that Louis Sullivan was asked to design the transportation building at the World's Fair. Now, the transportation building wasn't for people to come into by train. It was to show all of the new inventions of transportation. But of course, if Sullivan is thinking, I'm going to design a building for transportation, it's going to look like it's for transportation. So this is Sullivan's transportation building. Now, if you were coming to the World's Fair by train, which building would you rather come into? This one, which looks like a modern transportation building, or this one, which looks like a medieval castle? And that's what he's getting at. So there is... I'll go back to this one. This is a very old, now just so you all know, the buildings that were built for exhibition halls were intended to be temporary buildings. So the building no longer exists, but it was sadly was never intended to be, it just makes my heart ache. But um, one of those, you know, he talks about in this essay here, to go out, to go in, in to go out. One of the things that, that Sullivan keeps talking about is you gotta know where, on a big, big building, you gotta know where to go in. So anybody here have any questions about how to get in this building? You go right through here. <laughs> it pulls you in like a black hole. You have no choice but to go right where you're supposed to go. So this is what Louis Sullivan is talking about in this essay. He's talking about how upset he is that when given this opportunity, somebody built a medieval castle instead of a modern transportation building dedicated to this free, new, fantastic, modern world they were living in. So 
The other building that we talk about is in chapter five, which is called the hotel. And if you have a picture in your book, you'll be able to see this is part of the, um, the Marshall Field store in Chicago. And what he talks about here, quite a very funny conversation back and forth between his student about whether this is a hotel or a department store. <laughs> and he's talking about this in other chapters about how it's important um, to um, use your faculty to, to here's, the, here's um, chapter, part of chapter three, having received the conventional college and fine art education of the day, of your day, it's a matter of course that you were not taught to observe what was going on in the great world in which your school was engulfed and sealed up tight. And in which school in consequences of your mind was in turn carefully and hermetically closed by your so-called teachers. So what he's trying to get his student to do is to be able to open up and observe with his own faculties and see what's right in front of him. There is a point in here somewhere where he talks about every building tells its story, tells it plainly. With startling clearness, it speaks to the attentive ear, how palpable its visage to the open eye. It may take you some little time to perceive, but it's all there waiting for you, just as every great truth has waited through the centuries for the man with eyes to see. So, when we get to this hotel, he's taking this essay on the hotel, um, not the department store. He's taking this another step and he is contradicting his student who's saying, it's a department store. I was just there. I picked up you know, a new pair of pants, whatever it was. Um, and it's, it's very funny to read, um, especially if you look at the details. So, this is a department store. And one of the main things that he talks about is were it an office building, it would suggest that function. There would be regular and equitable spacing of windows, that general suggestion of business and business housing, which would be unmistakable. There are a number of well-arranged office structures here and about, he's talking about his own. <laughs> um, and then um, he says, and not one of them has this somnolent, irresolute disposition. Again, we're talking drowsy, hesitant dis disposition of its masses. Said so this manifestly is a building to sleep in, perhaps to, to eat in. It suggests the drowsy, but then he gets into the details of um, Let's see, it must be in the first section here about how it's not, um, look at the building with your own eyes. Surely if it were a department store, all masonry would be reduced to a minimum and there would be an expanse of glass for light and display. If you doubt it, there are several department stores here about, he means his own, <laughs> that will testify Okay, several departments here are that will serve to illustrate my meaning. So you see, you are proven in error by the testimony of the structure, telling you look at the structure itself. Therefore, if the building be anything nameable, it is, as I have said, a hotel. So what Sullivan is talking about here is, what is the function of a department store? It's a store selling goods. And those front windows are there to advertise what's there and so that people come in. And what he's complaining about is all this heavy, heavy, heavy masonry on this first floor. And the fact that, well, what do you have above it? Well, it looks like you've got two stories on, the, on this first mass and then there's sort of another level and then there's a series of floors and then Maybe those are office spaces at the very top. Well, that's, there's different functions 
that are being reflected. That's what he's complaining about is that this isn't all of one thing. This looks like a hotel where you've got the hotel lobby at the bottom and all these little windows at the top are for different places for you to sleep and you're, you know, that's what he's talking about. And what he's referring to as if you were, if this were a department store, it would have wide open spaces. Well, he's referring to this. So it, try to ignore, if you can, this very central part, but look off to either side and look at how much window space is here. It's just all glass. It's display, it's lit up. That's, and all the floors above also, full of windows, full of light, full of air, full of display. That's a department store. And again, because it's Sullivan, he knows the most important thing is, it's a big building. People need to know where to go in. Do you think anybody has any question <laughs> about where to enter this building? This little round corner is at the corner of two streets in Chicago, and it sticks out into the sidewalk. So if you're way down the sidewalk, this bumps into the walking space. And it's so detailed, you're, it's so eye-catching, your eye is drawn to it. And there's no question whatsoever where the main door is to the department store. So again, in his essay on a hotel, where he's complaining about a different building, what he's saying is why on earth, when you can physically do this, and this is what is necessary for a department store, why would you make it look like a 16th century Italian palazzo? And that's what he's really talking about. And I'll stop sharing now, if I can get, there we go, stop share. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. You're welcome. All right. Uh, next up is going to be Maritza followed by Rupali. Maritza. Uh, hi guys. So um, first disclaimer, I am not an architect. Um, and this is also my first time meeting this. So I'm meeting this with the rest of you that are just now being introduced to it. Um, so I said this before most of you got on, but I, I'm gonna say it again for those of you who have heard, um, she can't read this book and immediately felt the need to buy many copies and send them to his friends. And I was like, she can't is a crazy person who likes wasting money. Now I got to chapter three, I got maybe two paragraphs in and I immediately understood and took back all the negative things I was saying. I understood that desire because I reached out to a few friends and implored them to get the book immediately. So I, I, I now understand that statement and feeling of she comes. Um, so this, this, these are very small essays and technically it's a, an, arch, an older architect with a sarcastic wit speaking to a young architect who's fresh out of school, he's so green, he still has a new smell on him, is what it seems. Um, and, you know, and, and the names are just interesting. It's like, the first one is a building with a tower. The second one is pathology. The third is a terminal station. The fourth is the garden. And the fifth is a hotel. Now, from the perspective of somebody who is not an architect, what I'm getting from these pages is a deep, in, like a really deep call towards these, this path for living one's life that is brought about by the fervor which, with which this teacher views his passion. It is obvious through the sarcasm and the wit that the older architect, and we're assuming this is like Sullivan, right? He has this passion about building and buildings that, and, and the design of them, that it just bleeds through. He's also, frankly, like a phenomenal 
writer, I mean, the verbiage used just paints this imagery. And I, I'm delighted that Sherry brought up Fountainhead because the moment I saw that paragraph on chapter three, I was like, oh gosh, that's, that's it. That's totally from where Ayn Rand got that. Um, what, what he's saying, so, so Sullivan points out, and he, he uses these very, very strong like word imageries to provide a cautionary tale of allowing others to think for you and to believe without question what you're told. And it's, I mean, the, the writing is, it's just amazing. Like he tells us, you know, um, you, you know, and Sherry called some of them out. Some of the ones I wrote, I'm not gonna repeat them because Sherry already put them down, but you know, he does tell us that, you know, we were taught to observe, we were taught to observe what's, what was, we were taught not to observe what was going on in the world. And he says, and thus, like any sample of canned goods, you remain quietly on the shelf where you were put. Holy crap. Is that what, I mean, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be an old canned good gathering dust. What the heck? That's what, I mean, he, the imagery is so fierce that you see it and it immediately causes you to have a mini world crisis to check your life and make sure you are not that canned good. Um, that's, that's just the way I, feel, I, I have felt about many of the things he says, you know, and it's so much deeper. You know, he's telling us that, you know, the, he tells us the image in a building is shaped by a man's values. It's also something Ayn Rand has been saying to us. And it's just, if architecture is not your thing, the manner in which he states it, you could take architecture out of the equation and put that which is your passion. And it, it just flows, it fits. And, you know, he's also so poetic. And he, and he quotes a few different poets. And when I saw a pair of, he went from a terminal station to a garden and I was like, well, this is gonna be interesting. Cause you know, chapter three is only like, it's like the longest of the chapters. It's like three, four pages. I, I had to read it three times before I could move on. So I didn't even notice that the next chapter was called Garden. So when I finally decided, okay, I need to go back to chapter three, but let's get through chapter four for first. And I saw it was Garden and I looked and if you want roses in your garden, you must have them in your heart. Beautiful, I had to go into a corner and cry. It's the, the, just, he's telling us to live life fully, but also with your eyes open and understanding that it's not gonna happen overnight. It has to happen slowly. If you allow yourself to, and to realize that some of your learnings were maybe not the absolute truths that you thought they were, you're gonna to have to rebuild. But if you rebuild from within and you start this passion inside, what you're gonna get is gonna be so much more beautiful and fruitful. And I just, you know, it, there's so, so many things that he says, you know, he's, he tells us that we need to become familiar with those things which are threatening super, um, social life and he does this from the perspective of architecture, which I feel like that kind of brings it out of the self and into an easily visual field for us. You know, when he points to a building and says, this building is everything that's wrong with social life. And I'm gonna tell you why. He does that. And in between, he's giving you all these like gems, you know, where he says, this building over here, it looks like an ill-composed solid. It has too much oil and it's too vinegary. And, and the, the imagery, I, I am, it's a journey. I, I, I can't even 
I don't need, I have notes guys that I was gonna just write and read to you, but I'm still processing these essays. And so you're getting slightly more gibberish and wonder, but it's, I am, I don't think I've ever read anyone with this particular style. The, it's definitely a teaching essay. Each one is an entire, it, it, well, each one is probably like 10 lessons in and of itself. And, but the manner in which it's done is this, it's okay. This, you're doing this all wrong. You're just ass backwards, buddy, but it's okay because we can fix this. There, there's hope for you yet. And, and it's, he, you know, he tells us, well, you know, the, we're, we're, what does he say? I think he uses a, it's an antiquated phrase now. We are in pregnant times or these are pregnant times or something like that. And he goes, but we don't have any idea what's gonna be birthed. And I feel like that's true today, even though it's, that's an archaic manner of speaking, it still applies. So we are living in times where there do exist institutions of learning where they don't actually want you to learn. They just want you to regurgitate what you're being told. And sometimes the path towards growth lies in seeing that, seeing it within yourself and actively working against it and hopefully growing something and, and not just doing anything by rote, but find a passion and move forward. And it's, you know, the, the idea of, so in, in the chapter of the garden, he tells the student, you know, don't despair. It's okay, this is gonna be hard, I know, but don't worry because I'm gonna be the gardener. I'm gonna make sure you're getting the right amounts of water and nutrients and we're gonna uplift you. And, and it's just, it's amazing. I don't even, I don't have the words guys, if, if you, you know, um, Google um, Books has an electronic version for free. So if it's just not in the budget for you to purchase a copy, go get a free one. I mean, you do have to sell your soul a little bit to Google, but most of us have already. You have to get an account, but you can get a free copy. And it's, it's I'm gonna stop there because I'm really, really excited to hear what Rupali has to say. But um, that's just my couple takes guys. This is the, um, you know, the untrained non-architect point of view. Thank you. That was beautiful. <laughs> Marisa, right, so that's 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 that was uh, just amazing. I mean, that's the reason I give these copies out to people, uh, in hopes that maybe one out of ten can get what you're getting. And what happens is that, you know, when you've been living with these ideas for a long period of time, you still they are so deep that a new person reading it will actually teach you something. I I love your horror at being of saying, "Am I a can good now?" <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so it, just wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Marisa. Next up is Rupali. So I'm going to piggyback on what Marisa just talked about language, you know. And um, the thing is, this book is not just for architects. It's not about just architecture. It on the surface, yes, it seems like that, um, and it's written by an architect, but he's also a philosopher at heart. And so this book is about how to live. And um, he starts right from the beginning. So why is he writing this book for uh, a student of architecture who's graduated from college and is ready to start his life? And perhaps many of us have experienced this that when we actually start working, we realize that there are so many things that are taught that are not useful and then you have to learn. There's why do companies have an orientation program when uh, new employees are there? Because there are many things that they are not taught in college that you actually need for work. Uh, one of the things that Sherry talked about was um, the influence that Frank Furness had on um, Louis Sullivan, the actual act of working 
as opposed to just sitting and regurgitating facts, right, in college, is what really gave him the confidence of saying, of saying, okay, I can do this. And that element in education of doing is very important right from childhood, right from the beginning. I mean, I think there is a part of memorization that's important in education, but then there's also a part of application, which I think uh, should be applied. And that's what he's talking about in this book. So in terms of uh, I mean, the, the architecture or the buildings are just concrete examples to kind of highlight these ideas throughout the book. Now, um, the first five chapters are basically about learning how to see. Um, he, he really implores the reader to look, to see, to observe. And then he says, when you're looking, look for the cause and effect of what makes this either a good thing or not a good thing. What is um, balanced about this? So what is out of balance? You know, so he's training the reader to start looking uh, for things. And then he uses a lot of metamorph metaphorical language to help the reader throughout this. So his examples of look at this beautiful lake um, in the very first chapter of the tower, he's talking about Lake Michigan and he says, look at this beautiful lake and he describes it. It's like a human being. It's not the same on two different days. Uh, at, at our school that I um, run, we always say no two days are alike because they're not, you know, we are human beings. We have emotions, we have our moods, we have our, um, you know, days that we are uh, excited and are triumphant and ready to celebrate. And then there are days that are more mellow. So he's able to say that, look, you know, your life is made of these ups and downs. It's not a monotone. They're punctuated with different, um, events that happen in your life. And so does a building and a building showcases uh, those emotions or those ideas in, in concrete form. And so in the second chapter, he talks about pathology and he says, okay, let's look at what the cause and effects are of things that are wrong. And how can you uh, diagnose uh, in medical terms, they would use pathology for diagnosing a disease. And so he's using that analogy in architecture and saying, we are going on this journey. We're going to look at things. It's not going to be an easy journey. We are going to go through all this confusion, this jungle, this, you know, um, and, and we're going to look deep. We're going to study. We're going to understand. We're going to make connections. We're going to discover new paths. And we're going to find something new that we should be prepared to undertake. You know, this is going to be a challenging journey. And um, he, he reminds us not to be afraid that he's going to be by our side, guiding us through this journey because we're going to find things that we didn't expect. So I look at this, chap this, this series of chapters as there's a lesson and then he's prompting us to do an action. There's a lesson and there's an action. So that's how, I look at these chapters. Now, in the terminal, in the third chapter, where he's talking about a terminal station, and Sherry, that was a beautiful uh, visual presentation of what the terminal station was and what it could be or what it ought to be. So he's able to say, okay, when you're designing a building, it's not just putting brick and mortar together. It's not just um, putting the elements of architecture, of construction or engineering together, but there's a deeper fabric that you have to think about. It's the social fabric. And so the study of sociology, the study of, you know, the history of what's going on and what came before us, where are we headed? Um, how, how did we come to this point or why are we, um, why do we need new functions? And so he's talking about the importance of including that in education. And what really happens in education, unfortunately, it's true even now, is that we instruct students that this is the way and this is how you should think. And he is saying, well, 
that's not the goal of education. You really need to start thinking for yourself. You need to um, study what, um, you know, why things are done the way they are and whether it's in architecture or as Maritza said, any other field of your interest. Once you understand the history behind it, you can then take this giant leap in creating something new, which um, he's talking about in uh, the terminal station. He's also talking about what are the elements of a beautiful piece of art, right? Whether it's architecture or uh, another uh, artistic form. And he's talking about balance. He's saying, okay, look at this. And um, the image that uh, Sherry shared, right? It was not at all in balance. You have this one heavy mass on the left and then you have the tower and then the arch is out there somewhere on the right, just apologetically standing there, not making any reason. There's no reason or rhyme for that. So he's talking about using balance. And when you look at uh, Louis Sullivan's um, station, you can see that there is pattern, there's a rhythm, you know, there are these arches leading your eye, your eye goes up to this dome. All of the forms are in harmony with each other. They're not conflicting. They're not just trying to get a position over each other. So those are the elements of design that he's trying to talk about and show us in the terminal station. The fourth chapter probably is the most dear to me because um, it talks about what education ought to be. And as an architect and as, a, as an educator, I feel, you know, he really, in a, such a beautiful way, explains the role of an educator and the role of a student. The garden is probably the easiest um, imagery or metaphor for everyone to understand, you know, it, it, in the springtime, everything is just new and blooming. And that's how children are. They are, you're just full of energy, ready to burst out and try new things. And along the way, they're going to make mistakes. Along the way, they're going to discover things. And he talks about that natural spirit, that natural uh, being that we have in all of us. And the role of education is to nurture that natural uh, human being, that natural talent that we have, the, the faculty of having the ability to think, you know, the mind. How are you training that in order to create, in order to survive, in order to thrive in this world? The goal of education is not just to, um, to pass an exam or to kind of go from one level to the next level or to do things perfectly the way that people are telling you to do because then you are not thinking, you are just recreating what others have created. Uh, and at some point that creation must have had value but after a while it has to change. As Maritza pointed out that change is inevitable. He talks about as we develop and as we grow in our own human development, um, things are going, new functions are going to come up, new materials are going to come up, new ways of doing things are going to come up. And how do we integrate those um, to think of new and better ways of doing things? So um, I, to me, that chapter really resonates um, with everything that I do. Uh, and, you know, it's for the educators to kind of find that, um, that inherent talent that a child has or a student in architecture has or in any other field and nurture it, cultivate it, train it, weed it, and kind of let it really uh, blossom. And you can see I know that there are many educators on this platform. It's a joy to watch that transformation happen when you give them the right environment. Um, you know, the seed is there, as Sullivan says, it's the soil and everything else. Um, I think Sherry alluded to that in her uh, description before. So to, uh, and, and then his language, of course, is very poetic. The last, chap the last chapter in today's uh, conversation is the hotel. 
And what he is saying is train your eye to see what, um, what's important. And the, the students start saying, okay, I'm beginning to see the light. And he says, well, too much light is going to hurt your eyes. So we're going to go through this slowly and we're going to unfold um, the doors of whatever uh, we want to see clearly. And, um, and that's how we're going to go through this journey. He also warns us at the end of the chapter that you know, buildings that are not honest or anything that you create that is not that does not have the integrity is treacherous. And it reminds me of um, the chapter in Romantic Manifesto of you know the uh, um, of moral treason. Let me just find the art and moral treason. So. Are we being honest? Are we being truthful to things you know that we create and how we create them? So that's um, that's what I wanted to share in a nutshell. And now I'm, I just want to share uh, the tower. I wanted to see why he uh, talks about the tower. And here are just images that I um, collected from the internet and. Um, what was the role of towers in history? Why did people build a tower? They wanted to get an advantage. They wanted to find a higher ground from where they could see uh, for a lo long distance, you know? And so it wasn't just a piece of um, beautifying something. It was a very purposeful functional element uh, of castles where they had to get to a higher ground. So usually they'd be built on a, a hill or a mountain top so that they were naturally raised. It was an area where they had to protect themselves. Um, usually the towers would be also at the gates because the gates were where people entered from and they needed to be heavily guarded and protected so that you know, whatever, whoever was inside the castle was going to be protected. And so the, the architecture that evolved from the need of protecting, of being at a taller, higher level is what gave the form to the, the design of the towers. And um, you can look at many different castles. Now, other areas where towers are used are in uh, religious buildings, whether they're temples or churches. And the church spires have, you know, the belfry, they have the, uh, so they, the, and then when they go all the way up, you see the cross, it's not at all uh, confusing. Whereas if the, the building that uh, Sullivan talks about in his first chapter, the tower, is this, um, building that doesn't really say anything to the lake that it's uh, across. It, there's this uh, fine detail of this woman on top, but you cannot even see those details. So when, when you're designing, it's important to kind of say, okay, who is going to view it? How is it going to look? Another, uh, here is another example of a church tower, right? That uh, it's, you can see the uh, designer's um, knowledge of the material that they're using to kind of create those very delicate fine arches and leading the eye to the final point that they want to make about religion. So the symbol of Christianity being the cross. Another area where towers are used are for holding uh, bridges and they, they are, um, strong elements of this architectural piece. So it's not just, a tower is not just put in place because it looks beautiful or uh, it's just going to add height, but it's also um, for a reason. And strength, he talks about masculinity in, um, in his uh, book and you can see this is firm, it's solid, it, it's uh, ho holding everything together in place. Um, and then we have these modern buildings, uh, the modern towers, everyone, you know, when we talk, I, I asked my students, I said to them, 
have you seen a tower? We're going to build a tower today. And um, which towers come to your mind? Of course, they all talked about Eiffel Tower and the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Uh, to me, I just love the Chrysler building. The top is so beautiful and decorative, but it just takes your eye naturally. And it does not apologize for its height. Um, then there are these more industrial towers, right? Again, they have a, a, a function and the form is derived from that function um, that the tower serve. So, um, yeah, so those are the pictures I wanted to share um, for the towers. And I want to go back to uh, what Srikant said at the beginning, you know, why, uh, why is this book written? And why is Louis Sullivan taking us on this journey? And he, he talks about liberating the mind from serfdom to tradition and to exhibit man's natural powers and their creative capabilities. So what are our creative capabilities? What do we um, think about when we are talking about creation? Is it uh, just art? Is it uh, the way we live, the way we lead our lives? And during all of these chapters, he's leading us through that journey. So um, now I'm going to just move to language and Maritza, you uh, highlighted that quite well. So one of the things that um, he does very well is just uh, a play on words, you know, homophones and homographs. Um, here is a, a fair, um, spread of Lake Michigan and then has the lake then a fair spread or there's a, a vein lady or is the lady vain and so those are all you know they make you think it's like the gymnastics of your mind you have to kind of really think how what is he talking about um and in that manner, he's also saying, you know, words symbolize something. Are the buildings symbolizing what they should symbolize? For example, like Sherry said, is it a hotel or is it a department store? And is it symbolizing what it should be? Um, he also talks about, you know, this, this is something that I do see with uh, some forms of art where unless the artist is there, I cannot make out what the art is. And, and there's this big mystery or mystical thing about, you know, artists think in their own way and no one else can understand them. So he's talking about our architects doing that with their buildings that, you know, um, they're not, they, they, what's he, he says in his first chapter, you, can, you can't always tell what's going in the mental depths of the artistic fellows. Sometimes they cannot tell it themselves. And so, how can you clearly share your values? How can you clearly in a concrete form express yourself? So that's, I think um, in lesson, the first lesson is, you know, learn to see. He says, when you look, you must suffer no mirage. You should look at things for what they are and as they are. And he really implores the student to start thinking for uh, himself or herself. In, in this way, your thoughts will take you on the clarity of a local atmosphere and will have a correct start in your studies. So he's saying, now everything that you've learned at college or in school, you have to put that aside and you have to start using your own mind. You have to start asking questions. Um, in, in the second chapter about pathology, he asks many, many, many questions. He says, you know, how are we going to get through this? What are we looking for? Um, so as an investigator, you have to investigate what is important and what is unnecessary, remove all that's unnecessary. And then you're left with this clear form. Uh, again, these are very, good lessons in design, in um, any form of design or any form of uh, a concrete um, thing that you create. In the, um, 
so um, right, we talked about sociology and uh, so then going into the garden and education. So what is the role of education in um, in our world? You know, we've we've sent children to school and for many years, many um, centuries, from prehistoric times to now. If you see, you know, the in prehistoric times, children were taken to caves for kind of as a, a rite of passage to going on hunts or to do things. And so they would take them to these caves. That was a really challenging journey to go into the cave and then look at these paintings and learn about these animals and look at these animals in these dark cages with these red and yellow uh, paints. And it gave the children an understanding of what's to come, what's going to happen next. And when they then went on a hunt with their parents, they could actually see, okay, this is scary. This is, you know, I can feel my heart beating when I see this animal coming towards me, but I have to use my strength and courage to kind of overcome this. And these kind of experiences, what children need, they need to not to put them in a constant state of fear, but to give them the opportunities to try things that are in everyday life, that there are responsibilities, that there are things that you create. Now, what, what most schools do um, is that there is a set curriculum and everybody goes through that curriculum and whether it's in architecture or engineering, I think in some of the design schools, there is an effort to do um, a little bit of building, but unless it's integrated as part of everything that they do, uh, and it comes with a moral compass, then it, it becomes disconnected. It's like, okay, I have my values and this is my home life and I have my professional life. But what Louis Sullivan is saying that education should integrate those two uh, areas. So um, one of the things that he says in the garden is nature neither hastens or nor delays. So, children are going to uh, grow at their own pace. But if you're not providing them the rich content, if you're not providing them the rich environment, they are going to shrivel, uh, much like plants do when they don't have enough sunlight or they don't have enough water. Now, he says, we're going to go ahead step by step. We are not going to instruct you. We are not going to reconstruct you. I only seek to persuade the faculties which nature gave you at birth. Now they are partly shriveled. To revivify, we send out new roots to grow, to expand, to bring forth as nature intended. So what are those new roots and how can you grow those new roots? Again, it's the experiences, learning to see, um, And he talks about, uh, you know, as, as your garden grows from the rich soils of humanities. Um, and so in education, learning about uh, history, learning not just about the technical elements is very important. So with that, I think um, I'm going to um, stop my part of the conversation and hand it over to Shrikant. Thank you, Rupali. Um, I think, you know, Sherry, Maritza, and Rupali did a fantastic, fantastic job. I just want to add one thing to it. Um, this book is written in, at the end of the 19th century. This is before, uh, this is actually during the First World War. And Ayn Rand talked about a sense of life, of, of what is possible to human beings. That was there during this period of Belle Epoque, okay? This is what Louis, Louis Sullivan is part of. So more than anything else, what he's talking about is a view of what a human being can be. And that view is so elevated that people today actually do not see it at all. The greatest value of this book is to actually see 
what is possible to us as human beings. That is what he's showing. That is the goal. That, and that's what he's unfolding. So Rupali talked about the garden, you know, and that seed is there in each one of us. And because of our surroundings, many parts of it are shriveled because they never really got the, the soil. They were kind of artificially constrained by different forms. This is a way of kind of seeing, going back to the root, going back to the seed and saying, what is possible to a human being and reworking that. And that's what this book is about. So it is a very profound book about human nature. And that's what we're going to study. Um, and I'm just delighted that so many people are here uh, trying to study. Some it looks like some people have already started reading the book. Um, and I have to tell you, frankly, I don't understand Louis Sullivan. You know, I try, but every time I come to him, I understand, I, I see things that I've not seen before. So it's very, very deep. Okay, it's very deep. Uh, every reading produces just kind of stunning results and any kind of application of idea produces stunning results. So that means I don't, it's like, I, I'm, I'm way out from what, what I need to be. He's, he's way above me, okay? Um, so with, with that, I want to now, instead of doing the breakout rooms, we're going to consider this as kind of semi breakout rooms. So I'm gonna give priority for, to people who are reading the book. So please uh, go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom if you're reading the book. And let's keep the topic on Louis Sullivan, on this book, on this view of what art is, what function is, what form is. Let's focus on that. Uh, so the same rules, type exclamation mark to speak or raise your hand in Zoom, keep on topic, be brief. Feel free to disagree on anything and do so courteously. Uh, who would like to go first? Go ahead and type exclamation mark. So while everybody does that, I just want to say a special thanks to Maritza for bringing up the canned good example. <laughs> I, I tried very hard to figure out how I could put that in. It's one of my favorites. I think maybe we should all get a canned good and put it on our desk <laughs> as a reminder. <laughs> to just always not be the canned good. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. Uh, first a comment or question is from Dave. Dave, go ahead. Thanks, Shikhan, and a very good presentation. Sherry, I wanted to comment on the train station in Chicago, mm -hmm. the older one that was not a Sullivan design. The word that comes to mind is schizophrenia. There are three vertical themes and over the three vertical columns, there's a pitched roof. Yeah. But then there's the single column, the tower that goes up over a single column. And it's like, he couldn't make up his mind. Are we gonna accentuate the three columns or the one column? It's kind of, a, well, I guess we'll just do both of them. And they, they interfere with each other wonderfully, but uh, it, it just, just struck me. But anyway, thanks again, it's very interesting. Thank you. And, and you're exactly right. Um, it is a, a, a very much a mishmash. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, next up is Joe. Joe, go ahead. So great presentation, everyone. Uh, and thank you. Uh, the, you know, the ideas I get from Sullivan is that he's trying to essentially open up our minds and create and so that we can actually use our imagination and talked about uh, Rupali had spoken about the idea of doing as opposed to just regurgitating facts. And, you know, when, when we're in school, we're just taught to essentially repeat what we've been told. And that there's a form, there's a place for memorization, but it does create a certain, you know, constructs around our mind, so to speak. But I, so my question is actually directly to Rupali is, Rupali is, uh, is this really what like very analogous to a Montessori approach to teaching? And essentially this is the same type of 
you know, that he, he, the approach that he's taking with this student is the same as approach that you take with your students and a Montessori approach to uh, education. So, uh, Joe, yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, Montessori looks at every child as an individual and Montessori also in her writing uh, talks about the, uh, the human mind as a seed and the environment as the soil in which you're going to cultivate it. And she says, the human mind is actually very fertile and it's ready to take off, but you need to nurture it and you need to uh, support it with the right environment, with the right conditions, giving them you know, the tools to think. And one of the biggest things in Montessori education is learning how to think. Uh, not what to think. And that's where I think the biggest differences between other, other forms of education and the Montessori pedagogy is Montessori really teaches children to think and to be independent. Um, to be, the, she also believes that you don't have to wait for children to grow up to do something, to do a work of art that's great. You, if you, she, she believes that they have the imagination that if provided the time and the resources, they can create something uh, meaningful. And most Montessori schools uh, offer that freedom. They offer, you know, freedom goes, um, freedom is so crucial for humans to be able to think. Um, I was watching uh, a documentary about uh, a, a child who had escaped from North Korea into China and she talked about, she had never imagined what the word love meant. And so imagination, you know, children can imagine at a much higher level than we can think. Uh, we, we give credit for too. So uh, Montessori and Louis Sullivan, I would say are, um, they go hand in hand. I also know that Louis Sullivan would give a copy of the Montessori handbook to the wives of his clients. Uh, so he actually uh, was a contemporary of Montessori and he liked uh, what she said. Wonderful. Um, I just want to add yeah, one okay. thing. You add, then I'll add. Sure. Uh, well, so I think this is, uh, Joe's, uh, I think, Joe, this is a great, a great point. Um, and I think Montessori is exactly this of saying the seed is in the child. So the, it, Montessori understands that a child is an independent being and the growth is coming from within. That's one point. The second point is that of the soil. Montessori is very big on prepared environment. So the Montessori classroom has all kinds of educational material that the child can interact with, but it is all there sitting on the shelves, always accessible to the child. So whatever the child needs or wants to use can go ahead, he can use that entire soil as the child sees fit. And the teacher is the gardener. You see, in most classrooms, teacher is not the gardener. What, what does the gardener do? Gardener does not actually go and make the seed grow, okay? The gardener cannot, you know, so, you, you, so, the gardener has to respect that the seed is the seed. The growth is being done by the seed. And what it can do is that you can provide all the environment and then watch very carefully and see if something is going wrong, fix it. If something is missing, provide it. So the role of the teacher is to, is like a, is kind of standing back, hands off and paying attention and providing whatever is needed when it is needed. Uh, so it's just a beautiful analogy between a garden and the Montessori classroom. Sherry. I actually wanted to add to that. I think you, everybody here knows that um, those of us in the panel are huge Montessori fans. Um, 
the Montessori environment, teaching environment, believes this idea so thoroughly that they don't actually call their teachers teachers. They're not, they're called guides because they don't teach the child. They're just there to guide like a gardener would. And I don't know if anybody ever caught, I caught this in their um, footnotes in one of these chapters. Louis Sullivan keeps talking about plants. He had over a hundred roses, different species of roses. Have to be a pretty serious gardener to have a hundred species yeah. of roses. And this was very much part. So he understands that this is, it's, it's good to think of this, all of what he's saying from that gardener perspective, that it's about fixing the soil. It's about providing what, what the plant or the student needs. Um, and, and maybe there's some pruning and maybe there's, you know, tying it up to scaffolding here or something like that. But, um, but it's really that student's job to, and you'll see that as we go through the chapters, it's the student that learns to see. It's not Sullivan teaching him to see. He is just the guide. Um, I can, we did, sorry, go ahead. No, no, just, just two, two quick seconds. I just wanna say for um, those of us who either are not children or have no children, don't despair. In these five chapters, I see room for us too, <laughs> you yeah. can be, you know, you can be young in your fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh decade of your life. And, um, you know, he actually specifically states that also in in the garden chapter. So, so there's, there's hope for all of us. We don't have to just be children. Yeah, all gardens are continuous. They don't, they're not, they're not a solid set thing. They're only that one thing for that one moment and then they continue to grow. Uh, I just want to add one thing. I always like to connect our different meetups. We did a meetup on metaphors just before this one. And the mm -hmm. point I was making there is that uh, the one, one lady brought up a very interesting point. For some people, people use metaphors and it just speaks to them and they get everything. And some people, it doesn't. In case of Louis Sullivan, I found that if, if you're familiar with living things, if you're familiar with gardens, growing things of how they grow, you actually understand Louis Sullivan much better because he's using all of that. He's using all the metaphors from life and using them at a psychological level, at a philosophical level, looking at what happens outside in living things. I was saying, okay, analogous things happens inside. And that's, that's his power. Uh, next up is going to be Les followed by Jyoti. Les. Yeah, hi. Um, <clears throat> I think everyone's kind of covered it on the panel as far as what's going on here in these first five chapters. And I'll kind of just share my opinion on them. Uh, just, Les, could you speak sure. a little bit more into the mic? <clears throat> sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is it better now? Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Um, I found going, I'm reading this online. I'm just using the online edition because I, based on my last, on the introduction, I wasn't convinced whether this book was worth purchasing or a hard copy, even though, you know, Sri Grant has um, publicized it very well. And, then I thought, gee, if he's going to give out 35 copies, this book really must have something that maybe I better give it time to see if I can figure out what's inside it. So, you know, I went through the first five chapters here online and I, I struggled. Um, the easiest part I found was in the foreword. I could clearly understand that, like where he was going, I could relate even in my own development in terms of, uh, you know, the goal, where we should be headed in terms of looking at reality firsthand and uh, seeing through our own eyes and using our own mind, as opposed to, you know, you get caught up, you know, with what, you know, people have told you and you just, you can fall into that rut of thinking well, that's the way reality is. But when you think about it, it really isn't. And so, um, 
and that's what, of course, this, you know, all these meetups are about is using your own mind. But, you know, reading through, you know, I found I had to use the dictionary and everything. And I found that was a little frustrating. You know, there was terms there that I didn't really understand. Sometimes I wasn't sure whether we were just talking metaphorically or literally. I, um, I find, you know, a, a, I like the way he's very cutting, very direct in many ways. He offers so many profound truths. Um, I could say I, I struggled going through the first time, you know, slowly, you know, the next chapter and then the next chapter a little bit. I found that after I'd gone through it, I had to really go back and read the whole thing again from the beginning. And then I kind of thought, hey, I've got to get into the right mindset here. And I think, Srikant, you mentioned that the last time is that you got to kind of look at this from a literature kind of a viewpoint. And um, so I got myself starting over again. And I started again to a very loose, very straightforward, kind of like rhyming with his terms and just flowing with it, letting it flow within me. And I was getting a better, I was comprehending more as I just let it flow and it just let it come to me because I, I was understanding where he was coming and all these terms he was using. I knew where he was getting at, and he was explaining it metaphorically, but he was using some great terms to explain it that I could understand. I just kept going, and I found it just it was kind of like rhyming, going through the different uh, chapters, and it was just easier to comprehend if you keep yourself in the flow. And so I still got some you know, concerns about some of the terms he's using, like whether He's talking about democracy when really, are we really talking about individualism here? Uh, he talks about the facts are coming sometimes through these chapters, but sometimes those facts are scarce. Uh, there, he uses terms like, um, um, he says um, this one point here, let me just catch this here. He, he uses it about, you know, um, <laughs> in some ways he tells the student, like, you know, you just can't trust authorities. But at the same time, he turns it around and says, but you can trust me because it's coming from my heart. But I said, and I said, really? You know, so, you know, you know, I need more than that. You know, I need more than that. Just because it may come from your heart doesn't mean anything to me. Just because you have that feeling doesn't mean it's true. So, you know, I kept, you know, raising that issue that I'm going to give him time because I think he's just pointing out the disease here first in these early chapters and uh, to try to get us in the right mindset that he's going to take us to the, you know, identifying all the facts and, the, you know, the particular parts of buildings that make it bad, you know, as opposed to solely speaking metaphorically. So, I think it's a great book. I think I've got a better appreciation for it. I might even buy the hard copy now because I find that I'm getting more out of it uh, as I read through it and, and learn how to read it and comprehend it. So I feel like I can get more value from it. So and with everybody, what everybody's said here, I think we can pick up a lot more and I'm looking forward to it. So yeah, that's good. 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 Uh, thank you, Les. Uh, I mean, firstly, I want to say that, I mean, that's just amazing. Um, I think the effort that you're doing, um, I mean, it's, it's well worth it. I know that, uh, but I really like your kind of description of the work. I also like your description of the problems. Um, the thing is that he is an artist and this is a work of art. What he's saying, okay, what do I need to do in order to reach people? It's not, um, it's not a work of philosophy of saying, okay, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to pre present my arguments in this way. He's trying to give you um, artistic picture and the whole picture has to be seen in order to see how, how it is developed, where it is going. Um, and by its nature, you're reading it sequentially. And so you don't have the whole picture yet. Um, and, but you can see that there is, it's worth pursuing. And so I think, I think, you know, what you're doing is, uh, is remarkable. And I think, I think that's great. Um, Sherry. 
Yes. Um, if I can um, throw in a Sullivan-esque metaphor for you, Les, um, we have prepared the soil and you're just seeing the very first leaves. So when you get, when you let it fully grow, you'll see the flowering, you'll see the democracy, you'll see all of it come. Um, but right now we're just at those very first leaves that are coming out of the ground. I also like your hard nose thing saying that I have to be able to see it myself because, and that's something that Louis Sullivan is very strong on. Um, at the same time saying that, okay, I have to give them time, give him time because he's, you know, he's talking you talking to you from over hundred years ago uh, with a different vocabulary, with a different set of context that is taken for granted. So there is a little bit of, stretching that anybody who's reading somebody from another time has to do. Um, and, but this is exactly the right, right way to, to read it. Uh, next up is Jyoti. Uh, Jyoti, you need to unmute yourself. I thought I did, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I did not read the book, Shrikanth, and you wanted people who have read the book to talk but now now it is now it is all, all open go ahead okay okay so having said that you owe me one from last week but i have changed my question from last week to <laughs> to statement this week just before the meetup started rupali said jyoti didn't get to ask to ask the question you know should i start by answering it yeah okay okay, okay. But, okay. but what i'm going to say today right now about this presentation I had an out of life experience from all your presentations. Mrsa, Sherry, Rupali, you guys are wonderful. And I think Louis um, uh, Sullivan was not only an artist, not only an architect, not only a designer, he was a spiritual person. And I say that with a lot of confidence. I feel like he has invoked in me, which I, which is the second part of my statement, <laughs> a lot of feelings of gratitude towards life, towards the, the life that we have, if we have, with all these things that um, uh, Srikanth was saying, that if you have passion for gardens, you have passion for pictures, you will understand this book and you will relish it. I, why I say this with confidence is where I live, there's a 360 degree view around me. Early in the morning, I go in the front and I see the sunrise and the reflection of it in the water. And every day, every day, I have different feeling about it. It's not the same, like I think one of you said, it's not the same every day. The moods change and I can attest to you that does happen. The water flows and it takes the form of the atmosphere, the environment and the sunrise and the, at the back, the sun, um, um, sunset, they all bring in me, of course, the feeling of gratitude and creativity. Like what am I doing with my life? I am so fortunate to live in a place like this. So when I, um, I don't have the book yet. I don't know what is happening. It's in the mail or it will come. I'll probably go down. It will be sitting in the mail. I don't know. But I'm very, very, very enthusiastic to read this. And I will also say that, and it might happen. You guys are younger than me. When you have traveled all the journeys and you have experienced darkness in your life, and when you are presented with presentations like you did and what I see in the mornings, you feel like somebody has given you another birth. You are in the same life, but you have born again like a different person. You have a different DNA in you. You have a different sense of appreciation in life. And I think this is what Louis Sullivan did. He, without you guys going like Maritza said so well, you could, be, you could be enjoying this when you are in your 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And Maritza, that is so very true because I experience and encounter this 
every single day and I'm older than you guys. <laughs> so I am um, looking forward. This is my takeaway from here, that if at all I was going to back off from reading this abstract book, like you, Shelley, you were telling me last time in the breakout, oh, it's a little hard to understand. And I said, ah, I have limited time in my hands. Do I really want to read this? And I said, no, 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 you got to go and read this. So I am going to read this. By golly, I'm going to make sure that when you come here next week, I have everything. I'm armed up. Well, thank you. Thank you for your presentations. I truly enjoyed and appreciated that. And Rupali, you will get some pictures. If I can. Just... Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to those pictures. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. I just want to make a really quick comment here. You know, um, Jyoti said something, and I, I am of the mind that you actually cannot be a gardener and not have some type of spirituality. Um, and I'm saying that as fact, damn it. Um, I, I, I really think that there's just something about communion with soil that changes something within you. There just, there, there's no, no way around it. You know, I'm a city girl. I have spent most of my life in cities. I want to say, Oh gosh, 11, 12 years ago is when I first got really heavily involved in gardening. And I started going to a garden and I said, I have zero clue what to do. My mom used to grow roses, but that's been a while. Can I help? And they showed me three different weeds and said, can you just go around and pull these flowers if you see them? So I literally went for three weeks every day and that's all I did. A year later, I was the main caretaker of that garden. And I was helping create other garden spaces throughout the city. It changes your entire world view to commune with soil. Also, this is a slight geeky fact here for you guys. Science has found that there is, there is some spore that is released from dirt that actually affects your brain and promotes the I'm not a scientist, so I don't remember the actual name of the, um, it's like oxycotin, but it's not. It's some chemical in your brain that releases feel good vibes for you. So- Endorphins, maybe, endorphins. Ah, yes, thank endorphins. you. Oh, yes. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. That, that. So the soil does that for you. So that's slightly tangential to this discussion, but I just wanted to put that out there. Wonderful. Um, so Jyoti, that was, that was just beautiful. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, that at one hand, it is kind of, it is full appreciation of the nature. On the other hand, it's a very deeply spiritual work. Um, Louis Sullivan has both of them. Uh, and if you have appreciation of nature, actually Louis Sullivan's book is actually going to be very easy for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't think it's going to be difficult. For some people, for less, it is very, very difficult. For you, it's going to be, you're going to be puzzled. You're going to say, why, why, why did you say that this was a difficult thing? This is just, this is easy because it's, it's a question of what you're familiar with. It's a, if you're familiar, if you're okay, if you love nature and have a artistic bend to how you think about things, then Louis Sullivan is the most natural. So it's very easy, actually. Everything will make sense. There may be some questions here and there, but basically you will, it'll speak to you directly. And yes, it is, it is deeply spiritual uh, because what he is saying is they're saying, what can human being be at its best? And just talking just about that, all of this, again, continuing the garden analogy, the first five chapters was mostly about pulling out weeds, as Marisa was saying. That's all we're doing so far. Okay, with a little bit of saying, okay, why are we doing it? Let me give you a little bit of reasons, but mostly it is pulling out weeds. And you need to do that in a garden because otherwise there isn't space. Um, and uh, again, connecting it to the next meetup that is coming up, which is the Uda Loop. There, you know, John Boyd talks about deductive destruction and creative induction you can't do creative induction without doing deductive destruction. If you continue to hold on 
to your old forms and old ideas, there isn't space for you to do anything. So you have to take them apart before, before you can build. Next up is Kevin. Yes, yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I'm going to share one uh, uh, statement from book. Also, question about the um, metaphor. As he talked about uh, thinking. Thinking is a uh, philosophy. The best there is reading and listening. Can to do is to simulate you to think your own thoughts. But nine times of 10, you are thinking for other men's thoughts, not your own. Uh, then he mentioned that pseudo thinking is always uh, imitative. Real thinking is always creative. Real thinking is always uh, in the present sense, tense. I might go a little bit confused about the metaphors here below. It's knowledge is of the head. Understanding is of the heart. Uh, knowledge is of the intellect. Understanding is on instinct. Well, anyone can come about the last one, about the knowledge and uh, understanding. Go ahead. Um, I, I th think you're very right. I, I always, I keep wanting to go back to um, this metaphor because I just so love the metaphor Maritza was using, the, his, his phrase on um, uh, canned goods. Uh, <laughs> um, you're right, much of our knowledge is given to us um, quite often. It's up to us individually to accept that or dig deeper and observe with our own eyes, make sure that that is information that is understood fully on our, of our own. And that's how you can get to that state. Um, uh, I personally love metaphors the way he does. And so, um, and I've read this book so many, so many times, but for some reason, the whole canned good one <laughs> metaphor has just made me giggle in the last uh, few weeks. Um, it's just, it's, it's the, the one thing in these five chapters on this reading that has really just hit my funny bone. Um, so I think that's a way of thinking of it. Um, is your information knowledge that is canned good or is the information understanding, which is hard won, hard thought by your own actions and your own processing? Okay, uh, Rupali, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, share that, you know, to train our mind to think is quite a difficult task. It's um, because uh, as he correctly points out, we are bombarded with so many uh, ways, you know, so much information of what others are thinking and writing or what they want us to think uh, that sometimes we are just repeating what is right or what it seems like right. And he, in this book, he's teaching us how to kind of parse that and come to the core of what the reality is. And every so often he'll point out, you know, think for yourself and figure out, is this really true? He's asking the question, is this really what you see? And he, he prompts the uh, student with questions because when you ask the questions you are thinking and you're training your mind to say, hmm, maybe it is not what it seems to be. Um, so coming to your own understanding is from your own knowledge of what you are thinking and um, that goes hand in hand with uh, his thought on independence. So that's my two cents. Wonderful. Um, what I would say, uh, Kevin, that's a great question. See, what happens is that most people, when they think of learning, especially in the education system, um, it's kind of taking somebody else's ideas whom they have and just kind of taking the ideas in directly. Okay. Uh, and you're just trying to absorb ideas of other people. You really do not know how these ideas came to be, how they're connected, 
how they are being they're, they're used. You're just kind of floating around with these ideas. These are, um, and that's a great example uh, of what he's meaning by when he says it is only of, of the mind, only of uh, knowledge. Um, what he is advocating is that you have to actually build the ideas yourself. A great example of that, again, going back to Rupali and the Montessori system, is take something simple like arithmetic. The way in which mathematics is taught in Montessori is through materials. So they have these different rods of different sizes. They have all these beads and they manipulate that. And it's by working, them working with these things that they develop concepts or like addition. What does addition actually mean? So they have a concrete, instead of saying two plus two is four, or this is how you do uh, addition. This is how you do multiplication. They actually physically see and manipulate with their hands what these things are. So when they have concepts, now those concepts are grounded. So that's the distinction that you're saying. And then when you're doing all your body, your emotions and your mind are working on producing these concepts, which you yourself have grounded and used. Now that is a full integration of your mind, body, emotions, spirit, all put together. Whereas the way in which education is regarded is a pure copying, imitation of the form. Again, it goes back to his core idea of form and function. What he's saying is that in education, people are focused only on form. They're just taking form of somebody else's knowledge. It's not really understanding because this being able to go back and forth between ideas, actions, and emotions, that is missing. So they don't have understanding. So I'm just going right. to add to that, Shrikant. Um, mm -hmm. when, when you do these exercises uh, over and over, right? So it seems very laborious when Shrikant talked about taking two plus two, and then you do the same when you're learning nouns and verbs, or when you're learning a new concept, maybe you're learning the Pythagorean theorem, or you're learning, um, say, quadratic equations. And as you progress through algebra, you're learning more of these. But every time you do these exercises of going back to the roots and seeing how was it, how did this idea first come to be? As the, what happens in a Montessori education is that children go through these laboriously in their uh, primary years. By the time they come to the secondary years, they can make the connections, but they can make those leaps of abstraction. And that becomes a habit of saying, here is something concrete, here is the abstract idea, and that's where that connection happens. And training the mind to do that is what happens in the Montessori classroom. That's where, you know, the first part is, you know, you're taking in the knowledge and then you're understanding that you're basically making those connections and those leaps of abstraction. Wonderful. A real quick add. It's kind. Go ahead. Should, should we follow our heart or our head? So follow your heart first. No, that one, uh, Kevin, <laughs> wait. Wait for this one. This is a philosophical principle. Uh, what is what? Um, that's a very, uh, so what, what I would do is that Louis Sullivan is going to establish this entire theory of how heart and mind are connected. And how can you work so that you do, because what happens is that this is a very deep philosophical point. There are all kinds of views about what heart is, what mind is. He is proposing something which is, a, which is looking at um, human being in an integrated way of how all these faculties are brought together and how do you bring them together? So wait for that. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's going to be well worth, um, you can, you can cheat by reading the whole book first, you know, you, you can read, you can read the whole book. That's not wrong. Sherry, that's, that's I okay. Thought, 
I thought you were going to tell him he could jump ahead. No, no, no. You can. You, okay. Everybody has been, you know, criticizing me for not. I like I, that. <laughs> I, I, I read. See what what I would normally do if I'm reading Lois Sullivan is that I would be reading all five of his books. I would be going and spending a lot of time in his buildings and doing it all in parallel, going jumping between these things uh, together. So that's just my my way of learning. Um, but uh, but you can definitely every even even Sherry and Rob are okay with you reading the book very fast and finishing that's it up wow. and then rereading the chapters to to join. Uh, Les, go ahead. We just in this house have a serious problem with Srikant's love of jumping to the very last part of the book and reading it there first. <clears throat> and we've had this long-standing argument that's gone on for decades about this. So I thought for a second he was actually going to say that. So I don't care. You can read the book. <laughs> All right. We've, we've come up with, a, a, a Kevin, you have a plan which is uh, yeah. approved by both me and yeah. Sherry. So it's it's very rare where we agree on, on yes. reading of books. You know, it's such a such a complicated thing. Uh, next up is Les. follow my heart by jump ahead. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Les, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, Sherry, you had that... Um... I think it was the showed the the picture of the department store in Chicago. What was the date on that? Uh, if you know what that, you know, was that around the same time or is that something more modern? And, you know, just, just I think it was in color. You know, the the photograph. But, yeah. The, um, and the other, and the other, just the comment. I thought, you know, this just as far as the architecture goes, I think this book is very much about architecture for the soul. You know, I think that's. And then I think that's what you're getting, that's what you're saying, you know, it's this integration of the, uh, you know, the heart and the mind. And, uh, and uh, so even though a person is not an architect, you can look at that, you can look at it as architecture for the soul and, uh, and development. So I think that's good. But there's, okay, thank you. Yeah, um, just to answer a couple things. So the first, um, the, the Marshall Field Store, that's the one that looks like a hotel. An, a hotel. Um, I think it actually looks like um, a palazzo from Florence, a specific one, in fact. But um, that was built a few decades, maybe. Um, I have here quickly that Carson or that Marshall Fields was founded in 1852. I don't think they built that building in 1852. It's the one you showed. Yeah, that, I'm not sure if that very specific. So there is there is that one corner, the building that I showed you. They later built out the whole block. Um, so I'm not positive if it was if they built it right away in 1852, but shortly thereafter, um, perhaps. Um, but that's not very far away. Maybe 30, 40 years from when Sullivan put uh, built the Carson Peary Scott Building. Um, so the Marshall Fields Building has um, structural steel, if we're gonna get into that part of it. It's a structural steel building on the inside. Um, and so it doesn't need to have that massively thick masonry. There's um, interesting thing that happens whenever you have a new technology or a new structural idea that comes into architecture. And this is something you see throughout human history something new that structural comes up is often used um, in a way that is hidden at first. Um, so when, when concrete was first used, when steel was first used, uh, it often was used to mimic an older style at first. It's kind of how it's, how it's funneled into acceptance. Um, and so Louis Sullivan is right at that cusp of questioning why we're using the structural steel and making it look like old medieval or renaissance buildings so it's the, that 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 point where he's asking people to break with the tradition because the, you don't have to be following it any longer wonderful uh thank you thank you sherry so next next time we'll be looking at chapters six through 11. So this is just before form follows function. And then probably, so these are the easy chapters. Okay, the first first few. Now, then when we get into form follows function, we'll probably do two, two chapters or something. 
because I'm, I'm calculating it by the amount of underlining and notes I have on each of the pages. Uh, so we can do five chapters this time. Uh, so six through 11 for the next time. All right. Um, so Marisa, Rupali and Sherry, any kind of closing thoughts? Well, I'm looking forward to um, the next chapters. You know, we've talked about unlearning so far. And the next chapter is Oasis, where he says, okay, let's take a break mm -hmm. and let's take a moment to pause and rest. So I think that's a very good place to begin for the next time is we are resetting some of the ideas that uh, he's telling the student to unlearn. Yes, and then it is building up all the way till his main point about form follows function. So this is like going from there saying, okay, now let's take a break and now build up for that. And then we will do form follows function, which is just that. Marisa or Sherry? I'm just excited. It's going to be good fun. So I, I, I mean, I just, I'm intrigued by the, always by the chapter headings. So we've got Oasis is our next spot. And then we have very intriguingly the key, which is exciting. And then we have values. And then we have Roman temple one and Roman temple two. Nice. All right. Uh, then we'll stop and there. There's actually, we go back to the department store again later. Maritza, want to, I want to say- nine? Yeah, We're doing Sorry. nine. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, then we've got, yeah, so it's going to be lots of fun. Marisa, I want to say that your reaction, you know, your comments was completely unexpected bonus. Yes. I knew that you would love it, but I, I think that you're bringing something really special. The thing, I, I'm not, you know, see Rupali and Sherry, I've talked about this for a long, long time. So this is part of our kind of normal conversation. So it's wonderful to see somebody appreciating it. Uh, and you're doing it, you know, you know, it's clearly from your own kind of spirit on your own heart of, ex of what matters to you. And it's all showing. And I think it adds a lot of, a uh, lot of pizzazz to, to everything <laughs> that we are doing. I am truly just so excited to be going through this journey with all of you. It's just great. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the first few chapters. I've read, um, I've read Oasis already, but I'm going to refrain. And uh, we'll chat about that next week. But um, no, I, I have to say to you guys, thank you. Because, you know, I had bought the book, but I hadn't yet gotten around to reading it. And when you guys said, we're going to go through chapter to chapter, do you want to go through it with us? I was like, sure. And um, this is going to be life changing. And um, I already can see that with just a few first chapters. And uh, you guys all get to uh, go on this journey together, all of us. So I'm so excited. Wonderful. All right, folks. So thank you very much. Uh, we have the next meetup starting at, um, at five o'clock. 